So before introducing Larry Busk, who will be our speaker today, and obviously we'll be discussing his book and the parts of his book that you were able to read, hopefully all of it, if you got around to it, I would just like to say one or two things that relate to the kind of structure of the workshop in general. Um, I've mentioned in the past the importance of collaborative efforts, building a community and a community that, and I think Larry is quite uh, indicative of this, that is cross-generational and includes different sectors of the intellectual population. So precarious labor, working class intellectuals, etc. And this might uh, not be readily apparent from some of the things that we do, but obviously part of the agenda is not simply to redeploy the star system and have these mega thinkers who we are just supposed to be acolytes to, but instead uh, cultivate a form of collective knowledge production in which everyone can participate from different perspectives and different angles. Larry himself came into the workshop a number of years ago. He joined us for an online Marxism class, and we've had an ongoing conversation about his research, and I couldn't be happier to be able to then organize a session on his on his book. Larry is a full-time lecturer in the philosophy department at Stanislaus State in California. His work cuts across the continent, so-called continental tradition in philosophy. Uh, it's particularly anchored in the Frankfurt School, but as you know from the book, he has an extensive engagement with the tradition referred to as radical democracy, the work of figures like Ernesto Laclau, Chantal Mouffe, Jacques Rancière, but then also going back to uh, people like Hannah Arendt. He's also published widely on um, phenomenology and other kind of aspects of contemporary philosophy as well as has, and this is clear in the book itself, uh, interests in ecology and the uh, contemporary environmental catastrophe. And he'll be joining us again tomorrow for a conversation with Julian Semple precisely on this topic. Um, the book itself, I, I should say, and I'd really like to strongly encourage everyone to, uh, to read it in full if you haven't. It's a, it's a sheer pleasure to read. Uh, Larry's an excellent writer, and there's an engagement that I think is quite unique, and that is that there's a hermeneutic sophistication in the sense that he focuses on particular authors, minds their corpus, engages with his secondary literature, but almost never gets lost in kind of the, the pundit the punditocracy that's developed in some of the secondary and tertiary literature, because the big stakes of the argument are always very, very clear. And those stakes couldn't be more important for the contemporary moment. Things like, how can you separate truth from falsity? Um, what are the stakes of defining what counts as the political? Uh, as well as the relationship to between the intellectual class and political movements, and more specifically, certain ideologies that inhabit the petty bourgeois intelligentsia of the Western world, and its relationship to the history of Marxism and other such things. So it's a very, very rich and timely book. What I'd like to do, Larry, is start with a kind of really general framing question. And that is that it strikes me that historically, one way of making sense of your project in this particular book is to situate it in relationship to a deep history that goes back at least to the end of the 18th, early 19th century, uh, the kind of revolutionary tradition that was calling into question the formal aspects of so-called democracy, or it was called democracy in certain cases, usually they were called republics and then later were named democracies. And that that was juxtaposed, these formal understandings of, of so-called democracy was juxtaposed in the work of anyone like Babeuf or, or Robespierre or other such uh, thinkers and activists to a more substantive understanding of democracy, where democracy wasn't just about rights and hollow principles and other such things, but actually had some substance because it had to do with power and more specifically with class power. And of course, through the course of the 19th and the early 20th century, this uh, juxtaposition between formal and substantive democracy would become fully theorized in the work of Marx and Engels and Lenin and the Frankfurt School tradition and other places. And so one of the things I, I, I wonder in framing your book is it strikes me that it's really rooted in this deep historical critique of the charade of liberal pseudo-democracy, all right, that gives us rights as long as we don't actually enact them or as long as we don't actually have real substantive power. But at the same time, that deep historical insertion, I take it that you're relating to very specific problems in the current conjuncture that begin with the figure of Arendt, who's really important for your book because she was a cold warrior and very much, even though she's become surprisingly a figure that is hailed by the left, 
uh, very much aligned on the agenda of US imperialism and anti-communism with a few minor exceptions, as well as the uh, racial supremacy and uh, you know, white supremacy and other such things. Um, so there's a diagnostic that you give us of the kind of Cold War moment, but then also of the insurgent forms of radical democracy from you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and the reinvention of radical thinkers as kind of post-Marxists in various ways. And so I'm curious whether or not that framing, both that deep historical framing and conceptual framing would make sense of your project. And then the secondary question is um, the specificity of your intervention into these historical uh, conjunctures of the Cold War, and then the kind of post-Marxist reinvention of the so-called radical intellectual. Okay, yeah, thanks uh, so much for that question, Gabriel, and uh, thank you for inviting me here, and thank you all for uh, coming to list of this. It's a real honor to be doing this. Um, um, with regard to your question, it, it's certainly true, and it shouldn't be neglected that the figure of democracy, which I'm sort of trying to undermine, I'm sort of trying to undermine the sort of critical value of the figure of democracy in this book, um, that the term democracy has served a very important function in certain historical contexts, certain historical political conjunctures, right, have really sort of needed to appeal to democracy. And there was a context, there was a time in which it made a lot of sense to say something like, you know, what we're given is essentially a kind of um, pacified and sort of uh, perfunctory liberalism and not real democracy or something like this, right? Insofar as Marx and Engels were talking about democracy, it made some degree of sense because, uh, for lack of a better term, the masses, the workers were revolutionary. <clears throat> not totally, but decisively. Um, <clears throat> but I think the, the critical value of the term democracy really depends on the conjuncture. <clears throat> and I think if we try to rely on the same narrative now, this narrative, which I think crops up again and again and again, not just in what's known as critical theory, but political theory more broadly, right? This narrative that says, what we have now is not a real democracy, right? Uh, a real democracy would be different and would give different results and uh, things would be better and so on and so forth, right? Um, that what we have now is some sort of sham democracy and that the sort of critical intervention that's necessary is to say, well, uh, uh, the, the central problem with the status quo is that it's not democratic enough and we need to achieve a real democracy or something like this. Right? Um, again, there might be a context in the conjunction in which that narrative makes sense. Um, what I'm trying to argue in the book is that now, especially in the global north, especially in the United States, right, this narrative doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, not because you know, many of the things that are pointed out aren't true, for example, voter suppression or the um, if you like the consolidation of political power in the hands of a few financial elites, right? Those, all these things are true, right? But if we think about this argument, I think it comes down to this premise that if we gave the people power, right? If the United States, for example, became a real democracy, that certain results would follow, right? Um, there would be less racism, less sexism, less homophobia, something like this, right? Um, uh, and there would be less neoliberalism or maybe even less capitalism, right? Um, and I just think that if we reflect for a moment on the character of the prevailing character of the empirical demos, right? Especially in the United States, that there's really no reason to have this article of faith. There's really no reason to assume that if things are more democratic, things would be better in the ways that we want. Things might actually be far worse, right? <laughs> um, it might actually, again, the empirical demos being the way that it is, being constituted as it is, um, being sort of uh, possessed by the, the interests and the de self perceived interests and the desires and the beliefs that it is, um, that democracy might actually be something. Uh, how do I put this? You know, we might look at democracy, a, a fully realized democracy, and say, like, oh, I, I sort of wish I hadn't asked for that. Right? I wish that hadn't been realized, because now we have something far worse. Um, and just to, to sort of put a finer point on it, I think this argument ultimately relies on this sort of bait and switch. Right? It ultimately relies on this move by which we say something like, yeah, you know, certain people believe really hideous things, certain political movements believe really hideous things, uh, whatever you like, the Tea Party, the Trump phenomenon, right? 
Um, but that's not real democracy. Real democracy is Occupy Wall Street, and real democracy is uh, the Women's March and things like this, right? Um, but I, I think that these accounts are never really able to explain why one instance of a popular uprising, people gathering in the streets, gathering in public spaces to demand something, why one instance of that is democratic and the other isn't, right? So, I mean, just to take an example will be ripped from, you know, the headlines since the book has come out, right? Um, you know, we've seen a lot of public protests following, you know, a new rash of police violence, right? We've seen public demonstrations over statues and so forth, right? And I don't know about yours, but my social media feed is filled, right? Following this is filled with people saying, look at this great example of democracy, right? <laughs> the power to the people, the power of the people to tear down statues and resist police violence and resist racism and so on, right? But then when there's an equally sort of popular and um, prevalent movement to protest the government's mandating uh, quarantine procedures or the government's mandating that everyone wear masks in light of the COVID-19 crisis, right? Um, this isn't regarded as democracy. We don't look at this and say, aha, what a great example of popular power, the power of the people to resist having to wear masks or something like this, right? And so there's this double standard whereby every time there's a democratic movement that has some sort of left or progressive content, we say, aha, democracy at work, that's what we need more democracy. And then whenever there's a popular movement that is right-wing in character, <laughs> which is demanding something we, you or I wouldn't like, um, then we say, oh, well, that's not democracy, that's, that's something else, right? And so what it comes down to then, and this to circle back to your initial question, right, about the appropriateness of the, the figure of democracy for the present conjuncture, right? What it comes down to then ultimately is something like, um, if by democracy, what we actually mean is not whatever the demos chooses to do, but we mean what the demos chooses to do, provided that that's a left or progressive in content, that it's socialist, anti-racist, anti-sexist, what have you, right? Then why don't we just say that, that what we're interested in is not democracy, but socialism, anti-racism, et cetera, et cetera, right? Skipping the step of democracy, because I think if we think about it for a minute, it's not actually what we're interested in. What we're interested in is a certain left content and not democracy as a form. Um, that was a lot. <laughs> well, no, I, I think uh, we might be even all jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit because one of the things I wanna circle back to is the question of political education, which is central to your argument in the latter part of the book. And what I was suggesting is not that the substantive democracy would be akin to what Rancière and Mouffe and others call a radical democracy, Nancy Frazier's another of them. But instead a substantive democracy would be something along the lines of um, uh, democratic centralism, of an organized worker state in which people were educated not by private corporations that were defending the interests of the ruling class, but where there was a collective process of educational transformation. And so it would have a lot to do with content and much less to do with form, right? But I think that will lead us, just to make sure that I think that the, the lines of demarcation are clear. If you wanna jump in on this, because I take it that your main focal point is on this form of quote unquote real democracy, but I put a lot of square, scare quotes around this, that um, simply is the appeal to, yeah, the demos, the people, the plebeians, whatever you wanna call it, with no actual content to the nature of that politics. Um, but what I uh, jump in if you want to, but the, the next question that I had, and this is kind of going to the conceptual architectonic that structures a lot of the book, is it strikes me that there are at least two fundamental um, touchstones for you. One is epistemological, and that is the distinction between episteme and doxa, right? Between scientific knowledge that is rigorous and can be defended and opinion that can be endlessly debated. Right. And I take it that on that front, one of your preoccupations is, well, if everything is just doxa, if everything is just opinion, then this is an enormous gain for reactionary politics, but also liberal politics in the defense of capital. Right. Um, because you do away with the, uh, the possibility of making rigorous scientific claims. And by rigorous, I simply mean that they're fallibilistically, collectively produced, and they're true until proven otherwise. Right. And that the other major touchstone for you, uh, you know, you use sometimes a vocabulary of social ontology or something, is the separation of the political from other spheres, right? 
that the political would be this thing that's not about economics, it's not about society or civil society, it, ha it has, or it might be, you know, depending on how it's theorized, but there's an autonomy of spheres thesis that structures social relations. And it strikes me that both of those elements, the separation between science and opinion, as well as the autonomy of spheres thesis, are integral to the deep history of liberal ideology. And so I'm curious the extent to which the conjuncture that you're diagnosing, which is really looking at the post-war period and in particular the 70s to the present, relates to this deeper uh, criticism of bourgeois ideology, which presumes you can separate out politics and the economy. And it also presumes that um, politics would somehow be the realm of opinion in which all opinions matter, um, but science is you know, up for grabs. So I'd be curious what you thought about that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think both of these divisions are really the product of um, a, yeah, classically liberal social ontology, right, where, um, first of all, you have this article of faith that says, well, everyone's entitled to their opinion, um, uh, plurality, difference, contestation are ends in themselves, and any attempt on the part of any theorist or intellectual or anyone for that matter to say, well, no, this is the truth. This is the way things are. And if you don't accept that, you're wrong. That is the sort of kernel of totalitarianism, right? You get this in Arendt, you get this in most of the radical Democrats, you get this in, you get this in Habermas and Hanet and Fraser, you get this in <laughs> so much contemporary uh, political theory. Um, uh, Antonio Vasquez Arroyo, who's talking at this uh, workshop next week, he says, you know, at some point, democracy became identified with vagueness and uh, truth and certainty became identified with totalitarianism. Um, and I, yeah, I think this has the function of essentially shutting down any radical critique of society because this critique of society could always be answered by saying, well, that's your view, right? This, that's, that's a Marxist view, right? That's a Marxist idea and there's no monopoly on truth or something like this, right? Um, and it's ultimately the same thing with the, the separation of the economic and the political, right? Um, not always, but often, almost always, when uh, political philosophers say, well, we have to respect the autonomy of the political, what they mean is that we can't index political struggle to anything economic, right? This is certainly what Arendt means by this, by insisting on the separation. Um, to circle back just briefly to the, the uh, earlier conversation we were having, right, about this, this question of substantive democracy and a sort of really substantive version of democracy as opposed to the sort of bourgeois liberal formalism. You know, it, at this point, the conversation becomes about, well, you know, we're not talking about the will, we're not talking about the desires, the beliefs, the opinions of the empirical demos, right? We're talking about the true interests of society, right? We're working in the interest of the demos, even if we're not working according to their actually existing what, the beliefs, desires, and feelings, right? Um, the, the, the thing is at this point, you know, no one, no political theory believes they're acting against the interests of society, right? <laughs> against the interests of the people, right? Fascists don't think they're acting against the interests of the people. They just think the interests of the people lies in ethno-nationalism and so on, right? Um, and so at this point, it just becomes an argument about, well, what are the true interests of the people, right? Uh, socialists like you or I think, well, the interest of the people lies in socialism. Uh, monarchists think it's in the interest of the people to have a monarch. Um, Christian absolutists think, well, I mean, if people don't live Christian lives, they're going to hell. So we have to, you know, make, we're doing this in the interest of the people, Christian absolutism, right? And so the conversation then just becomes a conversation not about democracy versus something else besides democracy. It just becomes a question of, where does the will of the people lie? Right? Does it lie in socialism or does it lie in fascism? And then what we're arguing about is socialism versus fascism or socialism versus Christian absolutism or socialism versus liberalism. And I just don't see what democracy adds to the conversation uh, at that point. Um, especially when, you know, given what the prevailing landscape of political theory looks like, it comes with all of this baggage, right? This term democracy. It comes with this sort of presumed separation between epistem between uh, yeah the epistem the epistemic and the doxa as you put it between the economic and the political um, and so I just don't I don't see much point and I don't see much I don't see that there's much to be gained by insisting on the term democracy except in certain strategic situations and I think we have uh, so much to lose from it. Um, tell me if I've missed the force of your question, Gabriel. <laughs> 
No, I, I mean, I want to circ cir circle back to this eventually because I think it's essential. But let me ask you one other kind of big uh, thematic that runs throughout the whole book is that of ideology critique, right? And I take it that one of the reasons that for you it's so important to unpack who the quote unquote demos really is, is that there's this presumption of the kind of purity of the people or of the plebeians or what they want, as long as, as you say, the hidden premises, as long as they want the same things that the intellectual talking about them wants, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that what is left out of the equation, and I think it's an essential aspect of your uh, diagnosis of this tradition of radical democracy is ideology meaning the ways in which worldviews, the worldviews of the people can be formatted in the interests of the ruling class against the interests of the people themselves, for instance, mm -hmm. or generally misrepresent what's going on in the larger political and economic field. So I'd be curious to hear you a little bit more on, uh, well, I guess two issues. One is what is your operative understanding of ideology and ideology critique? Why is it important for this project? But then also I take it that what you're doing is you're responding to a tradition of so-called radical theory that has evacuated, for the most part, accounts of ideology under the presumption that if you're going to criticize ideology, then you're going to fall into totalitarian science and make claims to be all-knowing and put yourself in the position of God and other such uh, bogus assumptions. So I'd be interested in hearing you on both of those fronts. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, maybe most helpful, the most helpful sort of entry point for talking about ideology is to talk about a specific example. Um, and the example that's sort of, uh, I don't really like the word example, it's more of a model, I think of it that way. Um, the model that sort of frames the book, and I imagine we'll talk about this a bit more tomorrow, but um, the model that I use to frame the book is climate skepticism. Um, if you look at the data on popular beliefs about climate change, you see a very glaring gap between uh, what the scientific consensus is on climate change and what people actually believe. So there's different, of course, there's different uh, levels here, levels of removed from the truth, right? Some people deny it's happening at all because it was cold yesterday, right? Um, some people believe it's happening, but maybe it's not you know, caused by human activity. Other people believe it is happening, it is caused by human activity, but it won't affect anybody until the year 3000 or something, right? Um, all equally ideological, um, all equally false, I should say, all equally false. And I would add just, um, this is a little more controversial, although probably not so much in this room, but um, I would also add that uh, the belief that it is happening and it will cause devastation very soon, but we can have some sort of sustainable capitalist solution that would also, I, I would count that as false, equally as false. Um, so, okay, we have this widespread false belief, right? And as long as the people hold this belief overwhelmingly, again, not totally, but overwhelmingly, right? Then I'm not interested in democracy, right? If democracy means we give the power to the people who don't believe in climate change, well, I don't want that. Um, I don't think you want that either, right? Um, so we have to have a way to account for this false belief within the context of something like democratic theory as it relates to something like critical theory, right? Um, now, one approach to this, and this is, you know, I mean, if you know the history of political philosophy, you know this goes back to Plato, right? It's very, very long, colorful history throughout the, <laughs> throughout the Western political philosophy that we don't really need to get into, but one response to this is to say, well, well, the people are just incompetent, right? In my book, I call this the incompetence principle, right? Uh, the idea that, well, because people hold all of these irrational, ignorant beliefs, they don't even believe in climate change, they don't believe in evolution, blah, 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 right? That therefore democracy is bad. Democracy is not the way to go. Um, we need something else. Uh, this has kind of made, kind of made a, a big comeback in political theory and in certain domains of, of uh, mainstream political philosophy, right? Um, there was a book published in 2016 by a guy called Jason Brennan called Against Democracy. Um, and he basically argues like this, right? He says, well, the people are so stupid. The people are so damn stupid that we can't let them have power because they'll do all sorts of bad stuff. Um, so he argues that what we need is epistocracy, which if you think about the etymology there, it's totally, <laughs> totally meaningless, <laughs> unless, you, unless he means rule by letters, right? <laughs> rule by epistles. Um, uh, but what he means, of course, is rule by smart people, right? That's what he means. Um, this approach I really want to stress is sort of equally um, alien to the approach that I want to put forth in this book, and this is where the critique of ideology comes in, right? 
Because this approach basically just trades one formalism for another, right? Instead of saying a priori democracy is good because the people are inherently enlightened and radical and progressive and so on, this approach just sort of takes the brute empirical fact of popular ignorance, popular irrationality, and just takes it as a given and concludes from that that democracy is bad and we should have some other system, right? What that uh, totally occludes, what that elides, is the fact that this ignorance and this irrationality is not just a sort of spontaneously occurring fact of human nature, the way that Plato thought it was, the way that Burke, for example, thought it was, and the way that Jason Brennan thinks it is, right? But it's actually socially produced. And I think you can see this most evidently, and this is another reason why I use it as a model, right? You can see it most evidently in the, in the example of climate denial, right? Climate denial, climate skepticism is not just there. It's not just a thing that happens spontaneously. It's a very systematic, self-conscious political project on the part of a few right-wing think tanks and billions and billions of dollars in uh, PR funds, right? Uh, there's a great book on this by uh, Naomi Oreskes and the other the co-author's name is eluding me now. The book is called Merchants of Doubt. Um, and it's just it just kind of tells the story about how as a very self-aware propaganda campaign, uh, big money interest, the center of the capitalist uh, imperial powers just kind of propagate lies about climate change, right? It's, it's all there, right? it's, it's a very self-conscious project. So what we have, if you actually wanna give an account of this, if you actually wanna give a, a real account of popular climate skepticism, you have to tell the story of how it's produced and more than that, why it's produced, right? Why is it necessary for the prevailing system to propagate lies about climate change, falsities about climate change, right? Why is it necessary that people don't believe in climate change in order for the system to function, right? Um, why is it necessary that people, why is it necessary in the United States that we believe that uh, the United States has never supported dictators, for example, right? The United States doesn't do that. The United States is against dictators, right? Well, why is that myth, why is this falsity necessary for the reproduction of society, right? And so that's how I understand ideology, right? I understand ideology as, you know, uh, not to index it to beliefs, but uh, delusions, right? Delusions which are socially necessary for the reproduction of a given form of life, right? And I think climate skepticism is a delusion, but it's a necessary delusion, right? So it's a delusion in the, the Freudian sense, right? If something that's known to be false, or that is, a, I should say, not known to be false, but um, demonstrably false, and yet it's believed because one needs to believe it. Right? Not, as purely, not at a purely psychological level, but at a social level, our society cannot believe that climate change is real. Otherwise, we could never live the way we live now. Um, and so I think if we shift the theoretical attention away from democracy and all of its iconography to an account of, you know, uh, you put it this way, as I put in the book, right? Shifting from this logic of false democracy, oh, we don't have a real democracy, we need a real democracy, right? and shifted toward the question of the false demos, right? Why do people believe such false things so much and so uh, uh, trenchantly, um, and what can we do to change that, right? So the question then would be, as I put it in the book, right? Not how do we give the people a voice, but why do the people speak so wrongly, right? Um, and I think that's what the project of ideology critique uh, can do. I feel like there were one or two nodes of your question I didn't touch on, Gabriel. Oh, so. no, no worries. This, this uh, provoked a, a follow-up question. That is, you do have to wonder then if the question of uh, democracy or the, the people and what they think or their worldviews um, is to a certain extent a red herring in, in, insofar as um, one can't presume that people, particularly because it seems like the United States is one of your main focal points, have any real substantive power insofar as, you know, study upon study has shown that the individual voter, for instance, if we take that example, has little to no power compared to the big lobbies and big business interests and the PR firms and everything else. So I'm curious, given the account of ideology, which I think is, you know, largely correct, it's the produced worldviews, if you will, um, why would it be important then to point out or to focus on this question of, of the demos? A, a more succinct way of putting that is if in the system that we live in, the demos or the people in general have, have little or no power, why would 
or why should we focus on that? Isn't it maybe a red herring? Shouldn't we focus instead on the people who have the power and how to either get that power or destroy that power? Yeah, you see what I'm I do, I do, yeah. Um, I think there's three, th I, can, I can say them all briefly, but there's three things I think that need to be said. Um, the first is that, you know, I, like I said toward the beginning, right? I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about something like the concentration of political power in the hands of a few oligarchic, kleptocratic, plutocratic elites, right? We should talk about that, of course. Um, and I think, I mean, more than anything, it, it can be a kind of gateway drug to more substantive critical theory, right? If people realize that this thing that's called a democracy is hardly that, right? Um, it's not, you know, like I said, it's not false. There's nothing, nothing like empirically false about that. But one thing that I think needs to be said is that, um, you know, um, we could talk about, and it would be true, how the average, how your average sort of climate denying, Trump supporting, racist, sexist, homophobe, quasi fascist, right, doesn't have a lot of power, right? But that's not a bad thing, right? <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want that person to have more power. And if real democracy means that person has more power, then I'm not interested in democracy, right? Um, the second thing is that, again, this is true to a very large extent. Um, but I think we have to sort of measure that fact, right? The, the fact of what you just said, right? The concentration of power, right? We have to measure that fact against, again, I'm talking in an American context here, right? The modicum of power that the DMOS does have, right? Regardless of how we feel about something like the Bernie Sanders campaign, right? It would have represented a, a shift, right? a, sh a step, a tiny step, but a step in the right direction, right? And he couldn't win the primary against Biden, right? Couldn't win the primary against Clinton, right? <laughs> so, you know, it, and for no other, I mean, for a lot of reasons involving, you know, propaganda and ideology and so forth, right? But the, the sheer fact remains that not enough people went to vote for him, right? And way more people thought, hey, Clinton's a better choice, right? Um, you know, I don't want to get dragged. Well, I guess, I guess that's the, that, might be the stick, that might be the sticking point, is the assumption that there is something like the remnant of a functioning electoral democracy in the United States. And of course, Stud, you know, there's there's been many studies, both historical, sociological, etc. Anything from the electoral college to the rigged campaign system, uh, uh, um, primary system, to the amount of money that is necessary to promote certain um, candidates and other such things that suggest that actually, well, the the people don't have any power even electorally. So it's uh, and with all of the uh, rigged voting machines, which are controlled by private enterprise, which uh, there's no transparency over the uh, actual use of these machines and who um, uh, they're they're easier to hack than uh, you know computers from the 1980s and other such things. So I do think that's I'd be curious to hear you more on that point. But could it, could I shift to another question and you can toggle back to this if you like. Mm -hmm. Because one, one of the other questions that, that struck me in, in well, rereading the book is that there's a way in which you make a very lucid, very rational and straightforward argument that I think is convincing. It's demonstrably true, the majority of what you show. But as you just said yourself, uh, if ideology is embracing a belief that can't be otherwise, even though it's demonstrably false, is rational argumentation sufficient as a form of ideology critique. And I could push this a bit further, right, with the intellectuals who you criticize, and I think rightfully so, Arendt, Rancière, Leclau, and Mouffe, uh, in many ways, the arguments that you make, you could submit them to their doorstep, they could read them, and I would presume that their own ideological framing and apprehension of your critique is such that they would not rationally engage with those arguments because their social standing, their position within the star system, the lucrative nature of the conceptualizations that they've made and other such things will largely prohibit them from engaging with a younger scholar, taking his ideas seriously, et cetera, but also from taking the reasoned arguments seriously, right? So how would you deal with the issue of ideology critique and the limits of a purely rationalist ideology critique, if that makes sense? It does, it does, yeah. I, I think you're, you're pinpointing you know, I hate to throw this word around, but a sort of fundamental paradox in the practice of ideology critique, right? And I think this can tie into the, this last conversation we're having quite nicely. Um, because, you know, it, it's probably the, the starting point of ideology critique that false beliefs are not just false beliefs, right? That they're mediated by, 
socio-historical conditions, right? Something like this. It's not sufficient, you know, this is I mean, Marx and Engels and the German ideology, right? It's not sufficient to change our ideas about the world. We actually have to change the conditions that are mediating those false ideas, right? And I think you can see this most evidently, you know, with regard to climate skepticism, we can see it in, you know, dozens of other domains, right? Um, the problem then, there's just a kind of, you know, heuristic problem of, well, if ideology necessitates false consciousness in this way, then how are you and I having this conversation right now, right? How have you and I managed to somehow step outside of it, right? Is it just because we're so brilliant? Um, I'd like to think of that, but uh, I don't know. Good that, argument, actually. Yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and believe that because I need to psychologically, right? But, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, okay, we have that problem, but more, more, more meaningfully, right? Um, there's the problem of how to go about how to go about transforming the social conditions without at least making some headway in the way of changing people's minds, right? Because you and I could sit here and realize, okay, the problem isn't the beliefs in people's heads, the problem is the social conditions mediating those beliefs. And that would be true. But I'm not sure how we could, all, all of the initiates, right, all the enlightened, all of us who are woke to these issues, right, I'm not sure how all of us could affect the, the change that would be necessary without getting at least some people on our side, right? I'm not sure how we're going to affect a revolution if when presented with Bernie Sanders versus Hillary Clinton, most people vote for Clinton, right? Most people on the left, right, vote for Clinton, right? Now, if, if that's the level of consciousness that we're at, where Sanders is perceived as way too radical, right? Where Sanders is perceived as, as like way too far to the left, then I'm not sure how a revolution is going to take place unless we, again, affect some kind of shift in consciousness first, right? Even as we acknowledge that a shift in consciousness is not sufficient, and even as we acknowledge that um, that a shift in consciousness is, to a certain extent, not totally possible from within the present conditions. And so it's very difficult to think this, I think, but I think we have to keep these two moments in hand, right? On the one hand, it's not sufficient to just change people's minds. We have to change the objective conditions. On the other hand, we're not going to change the objective conditions with the demos being constituted as it is right now ideologically. So we have to believe that it's at least possible to affect some degree of a shift in consciousness through intellectual work, through edu radical education, um, et cetera, et cetera, through, through political activism, right? Um, if not totally, at least decisively enough, such that something like a change in the objective conditions becomes possible. Because I don't want to have a revolution where 85, 90, 95% of the population is against you, right? <laughs> That's not going to turn out very well. Um, and I think to circle it back to the, the last conversation we're having, I think it's very important to acknowledge that it's not about really about the demos. It's not really about them themselves and their stupid ideas because they're so stupid and we're so smart, right? It's not about that. It's about the objective conditions that mediate that ignorance, that's false consciousness. But nevertheless, we can't lose sight of the fact that false consciousness is the fact, right? It is the fact of the day. If we lose sight of that fact, then I, then I think we fall into this trap of just assuming that everyone is on our side already, assuming that you know capitalism is a problem of the one percent and the, the the media, right, <laughs> which are part of the one percent, right, and that's it, and cops, right, <laughs> and then everyone else is a radical socialist already, or almost there, right? They just need they just need the language that we can give them. Otherwise, they're almost there. And we, we lose out, we miss out on the fact that ordinary working people, right? That people who uh, have absolutely no stake in the capitalist project, right? People who are dirt poor, right? Will go to the polls and vote for Trump. Will go to the polls and vote for, you know, whoever, right? Will, even if they don't vote, will say things like, well, communism doesn't work because, you know, uh, hard work or whatever, whatever people say, right? Um, and that's, that's not one or two people, that's a huge portion of, you know, again, I, I focus on the United States and we can talk a little bit, a little bit about why if you like, but, um, but it's the United States especially, and, you know, it's not absent from the rest of the, the rest of the world either. So, so yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. That was a very, it was a very long answer, but I hope it, I hope it made some degree of sense. Yeah, I mean, it raises larger questions, particularly about the materialist theory of ideology that you find in Marx and Engels and Althusser and so many others. Uh, Mao is another great example where uh, practice and one's immediate social conditions are the forces that primarily sculpt one's worldview. And it makes me think of someone like Michael Parenti, who uh, was fond of saying that the biggest problem with the ruling class is that reality is radical. And reality is radical because people are poor, they don't have health care, the planet is heating up, 
and they have to hide all these things. So they've got a lot of work on their hands. And so I, I don't know if I fully line up on the position that you just took, which sounded much more like, well, it's ideas first and then practice second. I think that the materiality of one's immediate world, and this is also true of organizing the worlds that you participate in, really sculpt your worldview, can or cannot empower you in different ways. And so I, I would be curious to hear you a little bit more on that, but I do have one final uh, question that I, uh, I want to open up. So maybe I'll just leave that hang for a second. And that is that particularly because I know that you know the, um, some of the research that I've done on these topics and I presented some of this in the workshop, the lineage that you rely on, and you and I exchanged a little bit about this, of Adorno and Marcuse as providing us with an ideology critique that would allow us to reveal the extent to which the demos often believes demonstrably false things that are socially conditioned in various ways. I'd be curious what your thoughts are on the extent to which certain of those intellectuals were also subservient to dominant forms of ideology. Um, Marcuse definitely early on, I mean, he worked for the predecessor organization of the CIA, and then he worked at think tanks that were founded by the CIA at Harvard and Columbia, and his first publications on Soviet Marxism, uh, you can read the acknowledgments page and it's a long acknowledgement to the national security state. He later became radicalized and that's very, very important. In the case of Adorno, you had someone who turned a blind eye to global imperialism, was a, a very rabid supporter of certain forms of Western imperialism, um, also very bad on uh, racial questions, gender questions and other such things in various ways. And so I'd be curious, um, in the conversation just a moment ago, it was as if one was in ideology or outside of ideology. And I wonder if that's the best way of thinking about it. Isn't ideology something that operates at multiple dimensions? It adapts itself to different social settings. And aren't there certain ideologies that are very prevalent among petty bourgeois intellectuals who would present themselves as academic Marxists, such as Adorno? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, don't think Adorno and Marcuse are as bad as you do, but that's that's a different question for a different day, probably. Um, but I'm fully ready to acknowledge that you know, ideology critique is never finished. You know, it's not as though there's this button that you push or this light switch that you flip on, right? Of well, I was an ideology, but now I'm, I'm free of it, right? I'm clear, right? <laughs> as the Scientologists say, I've gone clear. Um, that doesn't, doesn't happen, right? I mean, I, there's all manner of intellectuals who are extremely perspicacious on certain issues and then just functionally allied others. I mean, we've all, you know, we've all met radical Marxists who have the best critique of capitalist society that you can imagine, and yet they talk over women every time, right? <laughs> woman starts talking, he'll talk over her, right? Talk again, totally remarkably like perspicacious analysis of capitalist society and yet can't seem to acknowledge his own position in this respect. Right? We've all met people like this. And so it's definitely never finished. And I don't think Adorno finished it. I don't think Adorno said all he could or all he should have. Um, the reason I go to Adorno and Marcuse in the book, and, and still I just always go back to them, is because in you know, the essays that I cite, I think they give the best formulation of this problem I'm trying to diagnose. And I think they do the best job I mean, because this is what they were interested in. Right? They were interested in the question of, well, uh, as we sit here, we could talk about capitalism and how it's a wrong form of life and so on and so forth. And then I look outside and people are setting off fireworks for the 4th of July. Right? And that's what I hear. I, don't, I, don't, I look outside my window, I see a few protests and then that kind of goes away and then people are back to barbecuing and celebrating 4th of July and hanging the American flag and so on and so forth. Right? And what's up with that, right? Well, why, why, why do people seem so stubbornly reluctant to, to perceive the things that are so apparent to me or to you? Um, so given that this is the problem they were grappling with, I go to them to grapple with it, right? They don't really, it was a couple mentions, they don't really talk about capitalist imperialism. They don't really talk about colonialism. Um, you know, and, and not to, not to endorse too strongly the question of you know, the academic division of labor, but most anti-colonial theorists don't spend too much time talking about false consciousness but for no other reason than they had much more pressing things to talk about, right? Um, you don't get an account of, um, you don't get an account of the false consciousness of <laughs> affluent <laughs> global northers in much anti-colonial theory. A little, but you don't get a robust account of it. That's not a failing on their part. That's because they were, of course, working on other things, worried about other things. 
Um, so if, you know, if I go to Adorno, you know, five years ago, I probably would have gone to Adorno because he was a sort of hip hero figure for me. Um, now I go to Adorno because there's some good analysis of some things that I think need analysis. But, um, so that's a half answer, half dodge to your question, I think, Gabriel. Well, fair enough. It's, uh, it, it's probably about time that we open up for the chat. So feel free to put your hand, raise your hand or put your name in the chat. I'm going to throw out really quickly, hopefully it'll come up later in the conversation, but I was curious to hear Larry on the kind of what is to be done question about political education and the kind of more positive project after this critique. So I'm going to throw that out there, but I see a ton of hands. So Larry, maybe you can just log that and come to it. Maybe others will ask it. Jared, why don't you turn your mic on and get us started? Yeah, you hear me? Yes. Good. Hey, good to see you, Larry, in the quasi flesh, I suppose. Um, so I, I'm really interested in this sort of discussion between uh, perhaps jettisoning the concept of democracy or rethinking it radically, and then its intersection with ideology. I'm just curious what, so what you think about a, a sort of other conception of democracy, namely the one uh, sort of championed by the late writings of Samir Amin. Um, and just to be short, to take his example, so in his, in Samir Amin's writing on the, uh, the uh, Arab Spring, and in particular, the Egyptian Revolution of 2011, mm -hmm. um, he critiques, so he critiques the reduction of democracy to purely uh, just, just hastily performed elections, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, he, and then he wants to redefine it, because in the case of the Egyptian Revolution, um, there's the ousting of Mubarak, and there's a very hasty election of Morsi under of pressure from a, a global neo neoliberal forces, most notably the Obama administration. Um, but this is actually this actually facilitated um, imperialism because Morsi's Morsi's party, the Muslim Brotherhood, has ties to British imperialism and global global finance imperialism since after World War One. Um, but on the positive side, so just to be very succinct here, a mince concept of democracy sort of, uh, he wants to redefine it as a more protracted and perhaps echoing what Gabriel said, um, a more practical process. And it involves in particular, the dissemination of political education of pro across a broad class base. Um, so it's a more slower pervasive um, sort of raising of consciousness and perhaps to use your language, a shifting of consciousness. Um, and in that regard, I can I see it as perhaps an attempt to wreck to circumvent um, uh, to to come up with a concept of democracy that addresses the idiot problems of ideology that uh, you and Gabriel are discussing. So I just was sort of curious to know your thoughts on that, or um, if you looked into it at all, or anything like that. Yeah, no, I am I'm a big big fan of Samir Amin's work, and I would count him under the the category of people who I think are basically right about everything, except I don't think they should appeal to the category of democracy. <laughs> uh, Ellen Ellen Markson's wood is another example of this. People who I just I, I think they can do no wrong, except that they still have this attachment to the figure of democracy. Um, um, to answer your question, I think there's a there's a occasional sort of anecdotal answer to your question, and there's a um, more substantive one. Um, with regard to the 2011 uprisings in Egypt, there's this wonderful documentary film made about that called One Half Revolution, I believe that's what it's called. Um, and, you know, it's, it's great, you know, inspiring documentary filmmaking, people uprising, uh, people rising up to overthrow this, you know, corrupt neoliberal, you know, stooge. Um, but there's the very telling moment in the film where there's, you know, a depiction of a riot in the streets, a demonstration in the streets, people are bad-mouthing, people are denouncing Mubarak, right? And at one moment, someone in the crowd says, you know, Mubarak is nothing but a Jew, you know? And of course, we could talk about the history of <laughs> Israeli relations with Egypt, but okay, that doesn't really explain this sort of just kind of disgusting anti-Semitism that was present there, right? So we need to look at the, something like the, you know, the uprisings in 2011 in Egypt and say, you know, that's good. I'm glad people are, you know, <laughs> rioting in the streets, you know, against something like this. But at the same time, we can't hide from the fact that, yeah, some people in this crowd are just viciously anti-Semitic. And again, not not anti-Israel in the way that one needs to be, but anti-Semitic in the sort of proper sense. Um, and so this leads directly into the more substantive answer to your question, which is, okay, then what's needed is political education, right? We need to educate that person 
to, you know, we need to tell this person that they can still be critical of Israel without being anti-Semitic, right? Those are separable, right? Um, and that's fine, I think that's, that's right, except that at this point, okay, um, you know, as I sort of started to allude to before, someone with very different political content, like a fascist, right, also believes in political education. They think that, you know, uh, the white race needs to be educated as to its own interests, right? Something like this. This is something you see on sort of, a, you know, what's this guy's name? Richard Spencer's website, right? He also regards himself as doing political education, educating white people as to their ethno-nationalist destiny or something like this, right? And appeals you know, to democracy too, constantly. He appeals <laughs> to democracy constantly, <laughs> right? And, and but here's, I think this is the key, right? He's not entirely wrong to appeal to democracy. I'm saying he's entirely wrong on <laughs> many number of other things, but he's not entirely wrong to appeal to democracy because there are legions and legions of people who believe what he believes, right? And if most of us don't, well, that's just because we need political education. Um, so Richard, Richard Spencer thinks we need political education to, toward fascism. You and I think that people need political, and I mean, right, think that people need political education toward socialism. So our argument is not really an argument about whether or not political education is necessary to achieve a true democracy. It's about socialism versus fascism. So why not just have that argument and leave the question of democracy out of it, right? What's, I'm not sure I see the upshot of saying, no, real democracy belongs with socialism, whereas Spencer can come back and just say, well, no, real democracy belongs with, uh, with fascism. And the sticking point is that he can point to the results of elections <laughs> and we can't, right? He's saying, look at all these ethno-nationalist politicians being elected here, there, and there, and there, right? Uh, you know, from Trump to Poland to, uh, to Austria and so on, right? Or uh, you know, Austria, uh, Turkey and so on, right? Um, and, and we sort of look stupid in this respect, I think, right? We look like, oh yeah, we're, you know, we're claiming democracy while that side is winning elections. Um, yeah. That was probably a bit too long. So. No, thank you. We'll talk more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sterling, would you like to jump in? Hi, Larry. Um, long time no see. <laughs> so, um, first of all, it was super nice because I know we had talked briefly about some of these themes before, um, but actually seeing them laid out nicely in writing and stuff like that was absolutely wonderful. Um, through the intro and first chapter, I was just highlighting almost everything because it was just straight fire the whole entire way through. Like I loved, you know, going through a lot of it. Um, hope to go through the entire book when I get the chance. Um, but one thing I'm interested in, like I think you're totally correct how you're pointing out um, these discourses over democracy tend to ignore the exception that they want to exclude, basically. Like, oh, democracy, its content is necessarily good and those who um, have horrible beliefs are outside the sphere of democracy, whatever that is. Um, and while reading through this, like part of what I was thinking through, and I might be uh, over coding some of what you were writing in like a Leninist vein, so, you know, correct me if uh, that's wrong there, but was this is a method of kind of discounting an idea of like the quote unquote dictatorship of the proletariat or proletarian democracy. Because that whole entire discourse is one that says like, yeah, this is a problem. So we want democracy for this group for specific reasons. Like we're taking up this very issue right here and we're solving it by saying like, no, we want democracy for this group and we want political education here and we want the political power to suppress and re-educate in various ways or allow political education of the parts of the demos, which, you know, <laughs> have these horrible fascistic beliefs. Um, and part of the reason I'm bringing this up and this is the substance of my question is I'm curious about this other discourse I see on democracy a, a lot, not so much the radical democracy line, but the apparatic um, notion of democracy that you get from like Derrida and stuff. I had to suffer through uh, Derrida last term and that was horrible. Um, but it was this whole entire thing of like, oh, democracy is a sovereignty of the many, but sovereignty is supposed to be one. So that's a necessary contradiction. Whoop, nothing we can do. Or like democracy is something that can vote itself out of democracy. Well. You know, that's just a necessary aporia of democracy. And that seems like another route of being like, yeah, this is why uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat is so bad, so totalitarian or authoritarian or some other empty term, because it tries to um, not deal with this aporia and just deal with, ah, we will be democratic only for the few and not dealing with that, you know, supposed contradiction or whatever. 
And so I was just kind of curious, since you're focusing so much on the radical democratic line and, you know, kind of the ideology there of just what you were thinking of this other kind of liberal reformist version of just saying like, ah, democracy is necessarily apparatic and contradictory. And so when we say that it's good liberals is the substance of democracy, that's just part of that aporia, you know. <laughs> um, so I'm just kind of curious what you think about that. Yeah, yeah, it's... um. I find uh, I find Dare's treatment of this problem rather shallow. I think he basically just kind of uh, acknowledges the problem and then, as is typical in his style, just kind of declares it a great paradox of reason itself and then walks away. Um, I, I think the problem becomes interesting in those moments that I, I think democratic theorists never really discuss, which is that, um, how do I put this? that besides worrying about a democracy which might lead to bad content, which democratic theorists are obsessed with talking about, right? Well, okay, what if the people democratically decide to do something, you know, racist or something like this, right? Um, that above and beyond that problem, which is a real problem, but above and beyond that problem, you also have the problem of a demos who might vote anti-democratically, right? <laughs> um, you know, an example that we could point to is obviously 1932 in Germany, right? People voted in functionally right, voted in the Nazi party, which was more or less an explicitly anti-democratic party. And so then it seems like we're in this situation where the will of the people, if we are to abide by the will of the people, we should suspend the will of the people, right? And so paradoxically, right, to be democratic means to be anti-democratic, right? And I think, I think the democratic theory never really solved this problem. And I think it's another reason why it might be better to just drop it, right? It might be, you know, we keep holding on to this term of what we, I say critical theorists, right? Uh, you know, we keep holding on to this term, even though it has all of these, I think, pretty, I think, right, pretty devastating theoretical, conceptual, critical problems. And so, I, you know, this is another dimension of why I think it should better, maybe we should just drop it, right? Just kind of say, well, you know, it, if a political movement is democratic, that's great, but it's not a necessary or sufficient condition for a radical political movement, a radical political change, uh, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, the person, who, this is not going to help me seem less authoritarian than I probably already am, but the person who uh, I think is best on this is Carl Schmitt. Um, in the first chapter of his book, which is the title is translated as The Crisis of Parliamentary Democracy. Uh, and I have a paper on this uh, coming out this year. It's the online first already in philosophy and social criticism. Um, deals pretty much with the exact problem that you're talking about. And I think Schmidt is much better on it than Derrida. And as you know, Derrida pretty much takes a lot from Schmidt. Um, and the, the conclusion of the article, the conclusion of the argument is the same, right? It's like this term is worth, it's more trouble than it's worth, basically. Um, I hope that gets at your, gets at your question, Sterling. Could, could I, because the first part of Sterling's question dovetailed with a question that I kind of asked earlier, but I don't feel like we got a full response from, and that is that I think that there's a difference, correct me if I'm wrong, Sterling, between radical democracy that remains moored to a particular liberal ideology and democratic centralism within the Marxist-Leninist tradition that says this isn't a democracy for everyone. Um, it's a democracy for the many. It's a worker state, and it's about empowering people but also educating people in a new mode of social organization. And it's not the democracy for the few that we get in the parliamentary tradition of bourgeois democracy. And so it's not just a term or a concept, it's a social practice that consists in saying, we're gonna take the bourgeois state, we're gonna use its power to break the power of big capital, and we're gonna redistribute in various ways, political power. Um, and in that regard, yeah, calling that a democracy, I mean, at the end of the day, I agree, the term doesn't really matter because the term has been overinflated, overused, it's a kind of value concept, et cetera. But mm -hmm. the social organization does matter. And democratic socialism, or I'm sorry, uh, democratic centralism compared to something like radical democracy or the, the sham democracy or the 62nd democracy that Samir Amin talks about, these are very, very different things. And so I guess one way of reformulating Sterling's question is, do you see a difference between democratic uh, centralism on the one hand and these various forms of uh, pseudo real democracy on the other? Yeah, it's... It, it comes back to this point, I think, of... Um, 
you know, saying something like, we're not talking about the empirical demos and what it believes values, doesn't believe value, et cetera. We're talking about some future state where everyone will be, ed where everyone will be educated into a proper anti-racist, anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist, anti-sexist, anti-capitalist uh, worldview. No I, no, I was talking about actually existing socialism, right? If it be the Soviet Union, uh, Cuba, uh, actually existing socialism. The attempt to take a bourgeois state and transform it in to a state in which it wouldn't yeah. be big capital that manages everybody's life. So it's not a you know communism to come kind of thing, not at all. Yeah, sure. No, no, no. I'm, I'm with you there, and it's it's insofar as the project right is about bridging this gap between where people are now, right? Uh, don't even put it that way, right? Bridging the gap between the capitalist state and the actually existing social state, right? That's a democratic project. Uh, in this conception, then I just don't, I don't ultimately see what's added by using the term democracy insofar as, right, we're operating with a certain conception of what we believe the interests of the people to be, right? So when I say democracy, I don't mean whatever the empirical existing people happen to believe. I mean, like, what's really in their interest and what's really in their interest is socialism. I agree with you. That's really what's in the interest of the people, right? But then again, to come back to this point, like, yeah, everyone thinks their own political platform, whether it's liberalism, socialism, yeah, liberalism, socialism, conservatism, fascism, whatever, they think it's in the interest of the people. And so our difference is not in the question of should the people's interests rule society, right? That's not the, that's not the difference that we have. No one thinks the interests of the people should not rule society. They just think that the interests of the people lie elsewhere than we do, right? And I think we're right. And I don't think it's a matter of saying, you know, <laughs> you have your view, I have mine, let's agree or disagree. No, it's a matter of, no, you're wrong and I'll, you know, I'll take the fight to you or something like this, right? But nevertheless, the question is a question of socialism versus something else, right? And we both claim the label of democratic for ourselves and, you know, rather than bicker about who's really democratic or something like this, especially when the other side seems to be good at winning elections and so forth, then I, you know, I, I, why not just say I want a socialist society? I can leave it at that, right? Why, why, why do we have to frame it in terms of democracy, which again has been so thoroughly uh, corrupted? Um, but, but this, this point I'm making, it might ultimately be a kind of nitpicky, pedantic, academic point, and I'm prepared to sort of acknowledge that, right? At this point, this argument I'm making might be more like just uh, academic, right? It might be a theoretical question, sort of, you know, what's the use of this term and what the term means and so on and so forth. Where I think this, this question, this issue becomes important is because if we're going to do this work that you're describing that uh, ostensibly all of us to one degree or another are interested in, right? This work of political education, we need to have a sober account of the level of political consciousness that prevails, right? And I think that if we frame it in terms of democracy, more democracy, more democracy, right? It's very easy, and I think this happens a lot, it even happens in people like Paulo Freire, right, um, is interested in political education, but then also sometimes has these moments where he says something like, oh, well, far be it for me as an intellectual to tell the workers their interests. You know, they know their interests better than I have a clue or something like this, right? He, he's, he's ambivalent on this point, and I see this ambivalence a lot, right? On the one hand, yeah, people have false consciousness, we need to change that through political education. Uh, but on the other hand, oh, I, I couldn't possibly hope to, I couldn't possibly teach anyone anything, you know, who am I? You know, the people know, the people know what's best. Um, and I think the uh, sort of inheritance of this latter disposition um, is helped along by an insistence on calling whatever we're doing a democratic project. Whereas I think we should just own it. We should just own that what we're doing is functionally, uh, who was it that brought up Lenin? Was it Jared or Sterling or both? <laughs> what we're doing is ultimately a kind of, it's ultimately a vanguardist project, right? That's what it is. So just call it what it is. Um, there are better and worse ways of doing that, more strategically and less strategically effective ways of doing that. Um, but, uh, and we can call it democratic if we like, right? As long as we're clear that that's what, that that's what's happening. Um, yeah. Wait, uh, Jennifer's up next, just really quickly. One distinction I think that would be operative is that between the objective interests of the people and the subjective interests of the people mm -hmm. in Marxist mm -hmm. terminology. And mm -hmm. if you can identify the objective interests of the people is living in a world in which they actually have food to eat and water to drink yep. and the world's not on fire and mm -hmm. that you can make a scientific argument for that regardless of the subjective interests that have been produced in their minds by the ruling class. But mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that and not belabor the Marxist-Leninist land too much. I think Jennifer's up next. So go ahead and unmute yourself. <laughs> 
Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, thanks for this. I, I think my question kind of builds on Sterling's in a little bit or um, comes at it from a different perspective. But um, I, I really liked this point you made about the form versus content um, of, of democracy. And it, it, so I will, I'm doing that thing where I apply my interests to this topic. Um, so I'm coming at this from the perspective of somebody who studies 19th century British literature. But um, I'm, it made me think about the way that um, in 19th century British liberalism, there was this real push towards defining liberalism in terms of a particular mode of thought. Um, Elaine Hadley has a book about this called Living Liberalism. Um, and she basically makes the argument that, that liberals tried to characterize their political position in terms of form and not in terms of content. Um, that it was about, it was about pluralism, about a kind of internalized devil's advocacy, being able to inhabit another position, being able to like kind mm -hmm. of be detached and think about something from um, another perspective um, and kind of at least temporarily remove yourself, if not permanently remove yourself from a party position or kind of political attachments. Um, but this was specifically a kind of anti-workers movement tactic, right? Like they're, the reason that this happened was because they were trying to discredit attack people who had political attachments to um, workers movements, not even really socialism, um, largely chartism, which was basically a pretty moderate workers movement. But um, you know, it was kind of, it was a, an attempt to unravel class consciousness or to discredit class consciousness as a legitimate political position um, and to sever it from liberalism. Um, so I guess what I'm, my question is about the kind of capitalist history of the way that democracy involved in the, evolved in the way that you've described um, and kind of how this, if, how this kind of formalist or anti-foundationalist understanding of democracy has been used as a tool of capitalism or how it's kind of really what the material history of that is, if that makes sense as a question. Yeah, no, it, it totally does. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I am, um, let, me, let me approach it this way. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that quote you, or the, the sort of account that you just uh, you just gave. What was the, the the author's name there? The Living Liberalism book. Oh, you. Elaine <laughs> Hadley. I'll write it in the chat. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I need to take a look at that. That's a really great great insight. Um, yeah, I mean, I think formalism really is it does operate as a tool of you know, it, basically an ideological tool in the way that you described. I think that's absolutely true. I think you can see it most evidently in the, the conception of property, right? <laughs> um, and it is the case that what I'm arguing against in the book is a certain kind of formalism, especially with regard to the figure of democracy, but against some comments that I'm hearing from Gabriel, from uh, Sterling, Jared maybe, um, I wouldn't frame it as, well, we, we don't need a formalist conception of democracy, we need a content conception of democracy or something like this. I would resist framing it that way for the simple reason that, you know, it, it's quite true that for most of the history of Western political philosophy, political philosophers were done on democracy because they thought that if you gave the masses power, they would take away the privileges of the elites, right? Burke was so against democracy because, well, he thought that the rabble would kill the, the monarchs, which they did, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, this logic was, well, we need to keep the, the masses in their place and not have democracy because they're a threat to the system, right? And, you know, there were certain conjunctions in which that was quite true. I think it would be a mistake now and a really sort of devastating mistake to say that if we achieved something like a true democracy in, in in whatever sense, right? Whether it's radical democracy, deliberative democracy, blah, 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 right? If we achieve that, then the same thing would happen, right? Because I don't think it's the case that if we gave the masses, I hate, I hate, I hate that term more than I can tell you, right? If we gave the people power, they would automatically change things into a socialist society is a really 
misleading and strategically and theoretically devastating thing to believe, I think, because it occludes, again, the level of false consciousness that pervades, uh, that prevails, I should say. Um, just to, to sort of put a few, a few of these things together, right? I think that democracy is a formal concept and I don't think it makes much sense if we're going to say, well, it's not a formal concept, it's a, it's a substantive concept and it means socialism. Well, why does it mean that? <laughs> if it means, if we mean by that, that socialism is the true interest of the people, I agree, right? But then we don't really need a new term which indicates that the will of the people shall be sovereign, which is what democracy indicates, right? You know, because then, I, I keep harping on this point, keep coming back to it, but then what we're saying is, well, well no, not the empirical will of the people, the will of the people once they've accepted that their true interest lies in socialism. Again, if I'm a monarchist, I could say, well, no, by democracy, I mean monarchy, because the true interest of the people lies in monarchy. Yeah. Okay, we could have a fight about that, but why fight about what true democracy is? Why not just fight about where the true interests of society lie? Um, I hope that makes sense. I hope that connects a few of the, the threads here. Um, thank you so much for your question. It's a really, it's a really good one. And I think the question of formalism is really key. Um, I think it's, it's sort of in the background and then at the very end of the book, I sort of, uh, <laughs> the very end of the book, I sort of come to the conclusion that really this was about formalism all along. <laughs> um, and Just so I think formalism- Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't disagreeing oh, yeah. with your, um, your skepticism of the term democracy or maybe your willingness to let it go. I was just thinking about how there's a history, a specific history of kind of saying you can have democracy or you can be included in democracy only in as much as you have no political commitments, right? Like yeah. only in as much as you empty out your political commitments. Um, right. Democracy yeah. doesn't mean a kind of um, emptiness of political commitment or something or a willingness to entertain them all equally. Yeah, yeah, I think there's something to that. I, my worry would be that as things stand now, <laughs> they could give us our political commitments back, but it wouldn't make a difference, right? <laughs> because most people are going to go vote for, you know, Democrat or Republican or, you know, transpose this to whatever context you like. Um, that the power of ideology is so deeply entrenched that, you know, you could have democracy in a less formal sense, but it still wouldn't matter. You know, the pacification of the false consciousness is so entrenched that it, you know, yeah, give the people all the power you want, they're not gonna, they're not gonna overthrow capitalism, right? And I think just to circle back to a question you asked earlier, Gabriel, I think this is why, again, I go back to Adorno and Marcuse, because I think they're the best on this question of, yeah, we can give power to the people, but, you know, if the people don't know what to do with it right now, you know, right now. You know. Um, Leah, I think you're up next if you want to unmute yourself. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I really enjoyed that and the readings too. Um, I want to ask about the object of our critique here. Uh, and so ob obviously what we're interested in doing is critiquing ideology. And uh, well, um, something I think I identify as a, as a deficit in this critical tradition is that one of the ologies that it holds in reserve, that it uh, exempts from this sort of critique generally, as, as, as far as I'm aware, is, is that of science. So I think this came out today in the differentiation, for example, between the two registers, uh, yeah, two epistemic registers we talked about, a science one and an opinion one. And it came out again, um, Larry, as you know, you were saying, well, if this is the fundament or the foundation of the left critique a lot. Well, if democracy means that we give power to all the anti-climate change people and so forth, then I don't want democracy. Um, I, the, the problem I see in this recursion or reservation of science from critique is that I think science has, has been the basis of um, some of the most pernicious ideas of, of what I would say is widespread false belief. So, you know, for example, we could think of the genetic science of that uh, uh, held Jewish, homosexual, psychiatric uh, villains, um, you know, as, as deficient and exterminable in, in the Nazi era, a, a racial um, 
and scientific explanations of racial superior, superiority to justify slavery, colonialism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so I, I guess the, the question I want to pose is, it, it's, am, I, am I understanding correctly that, that you are sort of reserving science in the special position? And if so, why? And, and, and how, how is it possible then to avoid these sorts of violative truths that come from the bosom, 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 bosom of science? Yeah, no, um, I, I think this point is a good one and has to be kept close at hand. Uh, I'm not interested in exempting science from ideology critique. Um, I think maybe the first thing that needs ideology critique is the, <laughs> the scientific practices, um, not only in you know, the so-called natural sciences, but you know, insofar as mainstream economics passes itself off as a science that, that, that yeah, the ide ideology critique there, very, you know, most of all. Um, and there's, you know, all manner of things that you sort of present themselves as just, well, this is just what science says. And I, I think that critical theory needs to be very vigilant, most vigilant in sort of looking at this and saying, well, you know, notice that the models you're using are sort of taken for granted just the way things are now, as opposed to any sort of historical constitution. Or look at look at the how the models you're using are implicitly, you know, heterosexist or racist in these ways, or so on. Right? That's that work needs to be done. Um, I well, I, the reason I sort of appeal to climate science is because I, I don't see any. Let me put it this way. I don't see much that's ideological in the actual practice of climate science. So I think equally, equally pernicious to this sort of uncritical acceptance of science would be something like an uncritical dismissal of science, which is what you get in a lot of posty lefty theory, right? Science is just inherently bad or something like this. And I think that's just, I mean, that's, that's you know, as bad if not worse than this other model of just, well, let's accept whatever scientists say. Um, and then, you know, I get this question a lot because I always sort of index what I'm talking about to climate science. So, well, the climate science says this, right? And, and that, not your question, far less intelligent questions I get sometimes uh, that say, well, how can you believe science, right? We're, we're beyond that now in critical theory. We don't believe science anymore. And I'm sort of scandalized by this, you know, because again, not that I'm not attributing that to you, um, but I'm sort of scandalized by this because, you know, <laughs> we're living through a time where we have this major problem which is going to cause just an untold devastation, first of all, to the global south, right? Um, and people in the global north are saying, well, I don't care what the scientists say, right? I don't mean critical theorists, I mean, you know, the ordinary people, right? They're saying, well, I don't care, I don't have to listen to scientists, right? Why, who, who made them experts? You know, in my opinion, that climate change is fake because it was cold yesterday is just as valid as, as some scientists, right? Haven't, haven't, uh, <laughs> haven't postmodern critical theorists been telling us this for years, for decades, right? Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, altogether socially irresponsible to observe this situation and uh, sort of uh, take the side of, of a sort of skepticism, general skepticism towards science. Um, but to circle back to your specific question, I, yeah, I think it has to be a matter of, it, it's hard to do, but it has to be a matter of doing the analysis, right? If science tells us that, whatever you like, um, the, these examples you mentioned about racial hierarchies and something, my God, don't accept that, right? Don't accept it, don't accept it because it's coming from scientists, right? Criticize it, right? But if scientists tell us that, hey, we need to get below 1.5 Celsius <laughs> emissions by, you know, uh, 2030 or else, you know, we're going to be underwater or something like this, then, you know, I don't see a reason to doubt that a priori because it, because scientists are saying it. Um, so, yeah, I agree. And uh, let's do both, right? Let's criticize science when we need to. And for the love of God, accept it <laughs> when we need to, um, because it's, it's a really pernicious problem, this kind of scientific skepticism, and, uh, general scientific skepticism. I enjoyed the religious slip of the tongue. For the love of God, rely on science. Um, you can take yeah. the boy out of Catholic school, but you can't, can't take, take the Catholic boy out of the, yeah. <laughs> Esteban, you're up next. Um, hi. Um, uh, thanks a lot for, for the conversation. Um, well, um, I, I would like to, to ask you if, if you could say something more about the, the Kratos in democracy, in the, in the notion of power 
strength, whatever. And related to that, maybe if you have considered this well, uh, old phrase that says that knowledge is power, and how uh, would it up, uh, or could could it be applied to the popular ignorance problem? Because you distribute knowledge, you, you shouldn't have that problem. And also, if you could say something more about the notion of will when you say or giving or considering the will of the people, somehow in line with Gabriel's um, um, question about the, 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 the objective notion of interest. So, because, and, and the, just to, to finish my, my commentary, my question, you, you said at, at the beginning something like, well, real democracy is occurring in protests and Occupy Wall Street and so on. And when I see those kind of those kinds of instances, I I don't see people saying, okay, this is these are these are our interests, and and we want to satisfy our interests. Uh, it's more like, well, we're being oppressed, we're being uh, in, 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 an, in a system that's uh, uh, not uh, that that's unequal and so on. We want, we don't want to be oppressed. And that's that's not a question. Of, that's not a thing about satisfying uh, uh, the the group's interests interests. But it's something more like well, so, uh, so something has to do with uh, the values of living or environment or community and so on. So uh, thanks yeah. again. Yeah. Um. Just to, to share another anecdote that led to my uh, thinking about this. <laughs> uh, back when Occupy first happened, I went down to, uh, I was living in St. Louis, Missouri at the time. So I went down to Occupy St. Louis and I was standing there on the street holding a sign and uh, <laughs> someone in a car, uh, two guys stopped by and they said, you know, what is this even about? I don't even know what this is about. And I didn't really know either, but I, I told them, you know, well, you know, hey, you know, 1% of the population controls like 90% of the wealth, you know. I said this really emphatically as you know, righteousness. And this guy in the car just sort of scoffed and said, I'd like to be that 1% and left <laughs> sped away. Um, and you know, this wasn't a rich person, but it was someone from the 99% who just was like, well, yeah, lucky them, I'd like to be them and, and left, right? Um, but to, to give a more substantive answer to your question. Um, the question of the Kratos is I think, I mean, it's it's, I think that's what largely occupies democratic theory, both from the kind of radical uh, tradition, the Habermasian tradition and mainstream Anglo-American political philosophy, right? Uh, the question of, you know, they sort of all take for granted that the people should have power, right? People should have power, that's sort of a, the baseline, right? What does power mean? Does it mean you get to vote in elections? Does it mean you get to participate? Does it mean you get to uh, contest the terms of political discourse through public action, like you get in someone like Franciere or Le Move, et cetera. Um, what does it mean? What does power mean? Um, and part of what I want to do in this project is to shift the conversation from that part of the word, the Kratos, right, the crusty part, to the question of the people, right? Who are the people? Who are these people that we want to give power? What are they like? What do they believe? What do they actually want? Um, this sort of thing. Um, what is their empirical character? And one of the more difficult claims that I make in the book, difficult in the sense that it's difficult to defend, um, is that I, I don't think this problem is avoided by a different conception of the Kratos. So I, I spend the book talking about radical democracy, I mention a few other accounts in the introduction, right? But I think that regardless of how we conceive the, pro conceive the Kratos, right? Regardless of how we conceive of, well, the people should be given power in this way, we run into the same problem again. Well, I don't want the people to have power, whatever that power means, if the people want this thing, right? And then, you know, you get back to this question of, well, I want the people to have power, provided they're educated in the proper socialist uh, uh, um, belief system, right? You know, that's fine, except if that's what you mean by, if by the Kratos, what you mean is socialism, then again, that is, it, it seems like the, the word democracy is superfluous. We really mean, we don't really mean democracy, <laughs> we mean socialism. 
And it seems just kind of like a sleight of hand if we want to say, well, by democracy, I mean socialism. I feel like I'm being a little repetitive, um, but I think that's a function of the fact that I, you know, let me put it this way. I think it's a function of the fact that um, we can try to sort of fit the, how does this expression go? The This round peg in the square hole or something like this. It, I always get the, the terms mixed up. We can try to sort of stuff democracy into the concept of socialism, but I think ultimately it's, you know, it's, it's not going to fit. It's just not going to, uh, we're not going to conceive a way to do that and have it, have the sort of equation come out the right way in the end, um, theoretically, strategically, practically, whatever. Um, so yeah, again, just <laughs> let's just drop it, right? <laughs> let's just we can do without it. We don't need it, right? You know, just dive in. The water's nice. Type thing. <laughs> Scott, I think you're up next. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the conversation and everyone. Yeah, and this is great. Um, I really love a critique of democracy and I like the way that you get at the question of the people, but I'm wondering a couple things. Like one is sort of why we're still holding on to a notion of people as a, a, a unitary thing. Um, in a way, the kind of divide you have between left and right already happened you know, in the 60s and 70s and the left as the sort of sectarian divides are like, as articulated by like black liberation or gay liberation that like they weren't included in the idea of like a pe the people, the masses, the worker, the proletariat mm -hmm. um, in a way that like actually uh, valued their like their lifestyles or their being. Um, and so I'm sort of going towards the question of like, to what extent does the people attach itself to an idea of the state? And, um, and uh, yeah, could we get out of this by sort of an anti-state perspective. Um, and then I, I sort of want to like connect that back to something that Gabriel raised about material practices because we've sort of, we've talked about voting and protests as two things, but, um, and, and we talk about people's beliefs and opinions, but I, I feel like there's another thing, like it sometimes gets articulated as counter power, but like people do things that are outside of all of these articulations of political beliefs that are very different, that are like socialistic or I would say like anarchist or something like that. Um, in their everyday lives, right? Like we're not actually saturated by this idea of the political in everything that we do. So like, why why keep the people, why keep the state, why keep politics, you know, as a sort of bourgeois uh, sphere, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, a couple things, um, but thank you so much for your question. Um, with regard to the people and the question of who's included, who's not, this sort of thing, how is how do we determine who the people are or something like this? Um, I think that's a, you know, that's one of the more interesting questions of talking about democratic theory, I think. And it's one that, let me put it this way, to, to solve the kind of problem that I'm trying to diagnose, like, well, what if the people want something bad, right? Something like this. Um, a lot of democratic theorists, especially the radical Democrats, so Ron Sierra, the club move, people like this, they want to kind of um, disentangle, right, or de-articulate, de however you want to put it, right, the question of democracy from the question of something like, a, you know, a majority or something like this, majority rule, right, which is how we sort of understand the, the term democracy in a colloquial sense, right, well, well whatever 51% of people want, that's what should happen, something like this. People like Ron Sierra, Leclerc, and Mouffe, right, they sort of take that and they try to just very briefly, but they try to articulate an understanding of democracy according to which it's not, you know, some some extant people who wants this or that, right? But the, if you like, this is going to be very cursory, but the creation of a new people through action, through discourse, whatever, so mostly discourse <laughs> for them. <laughs> but, um, you know, the sort of um, act, the sort of enunciation of a new political subject, and that's the people, right? Not some existing population, right? And whatever they happen to want, right? And I think that's, you know, it, it, it's an interesting advance over this kind of more simplistic, like, well, you have this locality of this polity and whatever, you know, 19 out of 20 people want, whatever 11 out of 20 people want, that's demand. Okay. Uh, the radical Democrats try to take that in this different direction. And I think they, they succeed up until a point. And then I think they falter when it becomes a question of right-wing movements that also do that that also articulate a new subject and a new vocabulary and shift the terrain of political discourse, right? As Rancier would put it, right? They open up a new distribution of the sensible or something like this. White nationalists do this too, right? 
white nationalists have invented this whole new narrative of white genocide and white replacement and something like this. And that's, that's an example of democracy as Ranciere would understand it, I would argue. Um, the problem is that no one wants to, I don't want to endorse that, Ranciere doesn't want to endorse that. <laughs> uh, and so Ranciere, the cool move, they have no choice except to say, well, that's not real democracy, that's not what I'm talking about. And then if you sort of oppress them and say, well, why not? Why isn't that democracy? You know, they can give you no other answer except, well, that's exclusionary. Well, yeah, but like <laughs> our version of democracy is, is exclusionary to them. And you've already told us that there's no way to adjudicate in this sort of meta, meta political way. Like what's really, you know, it, it falls apart at this moment. Um, which is again, <laughs> to bring it back, another reason I think we should just do without this term of democracy, right? Um, uh, to, to connect it back to your question about the state, um, I imagine that uh, Julian Semple and I will talk about this at some length uh, tomorrow, but uh, suffice it to say here that I am ultimately, I'm not averse to, I'm not embarrassed by the notion of something like a collective human interest, something like this. Um, and I think it would need to be more inclusive than a lot of other conceptions of that same thing have been in different historical periods. Um, but once we sort of get there, once we acknowledge that, and it might not be a finished project, but once we have a certain basic idea of what that is, then I am, I am, I would imagine you feel differently, right? But I am not averse to the idea of taking state power in the interest of realizing that end. Right? Um, I think if we fail to do that, and I'm, again, I'm anticipating the conversation tomorrow, but if we fail to do that, then I think we are always going to fail. And to get back to this question of formalism, I think there's also this, this sort of obsession in certain left circles with um, kind of treating failure as an end in itself in a strange way, um, because, well, if we failed, that means we didn't have to oppress anyone, right? and therefore we're more morally pure. Um, and I think it's a, a dead end, uh, not only theoretically, but more so uh, practically. Okay, great. Jamie, you're up next. There are uh, five hands in stack. So I think just as the timekeeper, if you really have an urgent question, get on stack now. Otherwise I'll close it down because I think the five questions will take up the rest of our time for sure. But Jamie, go ahead and turn off your mic. All right, sure. I'll try to keep it short, but my ideas have sort of been evolving as this conversation has gone on too. Um, but first off, I was just, uh, I thought your approach here was very, very interesting. I uh, really love to read it. Um, so I, I'm kind of wondering about, um, you know, you have this notion of the necessary delusion. And so, these are the false conscious, this is the false consciousness that arises from a society that is necessarily antagonistic because of the material conditions. You know, you know, within the capitalist society, the delusion becomes necessary in order to sustain that way of life. So how, like, this is, I guess, more of a practical question, how do leftist movements you know, if you're saying, you know, we need to get the majority of the demos on our side, how do you affect that in a society? Like, how do you, how do you do that without either first completely changing the objective conditions of the society in which then people don't have this necessary delusion? Or, I mean, because the other way around is, changing their ideas without changing the objective conditions. And that seems sort of in the realm of idealism and not very popular, uh, possible. And then I'll just tack on to the end of that. I also had this idea too of like in sort of discarding this idea of democracy. Um, I'm thinking about you know, we can have this sort of fight between ideas or like systems between like communism and fascism. And I'm kind of specifically thinking because like I'm a historian, I focus on Germans, so I'm specifically thinking about German communists and German fascists, the Nazis. 
and that they both adopted radical language, radical ideas to rail against the status quo uh, personified in the SPD, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, um, because parliamentarism and democracy was seen as a failure that couldn't uh, relieve the material conditions of people's lives, especially in the crisis of depression. But the thing was, fascism and communism both railed against that. But fascism was able to appeal to the bourgeois elements of that society because it's not, it, it adopts this radical veneer of changing things to make them actually work while not actually trying to move outside of the status quo, it adopts the radical veneer to bring in more people and then to affect basically shoring up capitalism in the end. And so if that's something that, you know, like a communist has to fight against the fascist in that sort of level, it seems like the objective conditions are always going to favor uh, fascists or capitalists. Um, and so how do you, if this is, you know, I mean, cause it seems like we're in this battle of ideas. Where do you start? <laughs> I know that's a big question, but <laughs> I'd love yeah. to hear what your thoughts on it. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's the ultimate, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's the ultimate question that has to happen at the end of this conversation, right? Okay. If you read, you know, my book and then accept all of it, okay, what do you what do you do differently in your life, right? <laughs> I think it's the question we should ask after every book, right? Okay, well, how does this actually change the way I actually live, right? Um, I'm not going to be able to give a very satisfying answer. I'll give you something of a, uh, I'll give you a couple of programmatic notes, put it that way, right? Um, two things. Let me go through two things, right? Very briefly. One is that I think something that uh, the left uh, broadly, however you want to think about that, needs to do is to acknowledge, as you alluded to just now, that the reason that right-wing forces are gaining ascendancy is not random, um, that right-wing forces are actually offering an answer, that it's, it's a false, hideous, pernicious answer, but it is an answer to questions that liberalism can't, can't address, right? Um, and so rather than, let me, put it, let me put this very carefully, rather than simply mocking and ridiculing Trump supporters, right, um, I think we need to actually try to under, not understand where they're coming from in the sense of, oh, they're making good arguments too, nothing like that, but understand what is going wrong in this person's life such that this becomes an intelligible answer, right? That doesn't mean forgiving them for racism. It doesn't mean sympathizing with them or excusing their racism because their life is hard. It doesn't mean that. It just means indexing the problem of the Trump rally, not to a bunch of, this gets back to a conversation we had earlier, right? Not to a bunch of ignorant yahoos who are probably Southern, probably not educated, probably not urban, and probably rural, right? All these people we can look down upon, right? They probably shop at Walmart, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think this is a pretty prevalent tendency on the left. And I think one upshot of taking this analysis to heart would be to stop doing that and to actually start looking at the fact that, again, <laughs> Trump is saying that something is fundamentally wrong, right? <laughs> that is what he's saying. His answer is wrong. His answer is, is, is his account is shallow. He has no, you know, he's, we can say whatever we want about him, right? But he's, his campaign in 2016 was like, something is fundamentally wrong and let's change it, right? <laughs> and I think in addition to a, a lot of other things we could mention, this isn't a singular account, right? But in addition to a lot of things we could mention, that's what attracted people to him. Um, and so I think we should understand that and um, approach political education with this in mind, not just proselytizing about the truth, but saying, hey, you know, I feel your pain, right? It's not a matter of me converting you to the truth because I'm smarter than you. It's a matter of me letting you, helping you to see that um, your anger is justified. It's just directed in, in, in bad places. That was much longer than I thought it would, than I thought it would be. But the second point is that um, I think we need to seriously rethink our attachment to decentralization. And this gets back to the question of the state, right? I think that, let me put it this way very quickly. One thing the right has done very well in the past 50 years is to put aside their sectarian differences and say, we have a common enemy, 
leftism properly. Right? Uh, some people are more interested in economic issues, some people are more interested in quote unquote social issues, right? But we all don't like communism, so let's just forget about all these things we have have differences on and just, hey, fight that enemy, right? I think that up to a certain point, the left needs to do more of that. That doesn't mean, you know, forgive transphobic activists, or transphobic people, as long as they're leftists, that doesn't mean that, right? But it means just, you know, uh, me and Gabriel, right? I'm pointing to him as, as if he's there and he's, <laughs> he's there on my screen, so I'm pointing that way. Um, you know, me and Gabriel don't agree on some things, right? As is evidenced by the conversation we're having today, but like, my God, like, I'm not going to dissociate myself from him because we disagree about Adorno, right? Like, it does not really matter that much, right? <laughs> In the grand scheme of things. Um, so I think the left needs to be better about, let me put it this way, about uh, singularity of action, singularity of will, um, which is what the right is good at. And I think is one of the reasons why they're they're winning so spectacularly, and we aren't. A couple programmatic notes to to answer your question. That is a very good question, and, I, and would require um, a lot more thinking and talking uh, to really to really answer. Sounds a lot. Oh yeah, I understand. Thanks. <laughs> sounds a lot like democratic centralism, Larry. But yeah. I'll just leave. Yeah. The, I'll let that hang because uh, Dragana <laughs> has the next question. Sorry, I can provoke you in passing. It's my it's my right as the moderator. Dragana, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, hi. Um, thank you for this great conversation and great questions from everyone. Um, I apologize in advance because I haven't read the book. I read only a chapter. So maybe in your book, you already um, give an answer to my question, but I ask anyway. Uh, so I'm interested in... Um, uh, I uh, read uh, Chantal Mouffe and uh, her uh, Democratic Paradox book of essays. I, uh, I understand that you criticize a little bit her, so I uh, don't know, uh, would you agree? But uh, I'm interested in her notion of antagonism, a term which she defines in um, relation friend-enemy opposition. And she uh, introduced this agonism model, which I'm interested in because in, I don't know, um, do you know about her article, uh, Art as an Agonistic Intervention in Public Space? And according to Mouffe, um, she said basically that critical artistic practices, which I'm interested in, can play an important role in subverting the dominant hegemony in this so-called agonistic model of public space, because in that article, she's very critical about uh, Habermasian uh, way of um, defining uh, uh, speech in public space or Hannah Arendt uh, and her notion of uh, agonism. And uh, she is uh, critical about uh, their, their, uh, their way of rationalizing uh, things in public space. So um, uh, do you agree that um, artistic practices can play important role in the, this, her agonistic model of public space, because she, uh, she says that visualizing, they have important role in visualizing, which is repressed and destroyed by this consensus, which is, she is really uh, against um, in this post-political democracy. So I'm interested in, do you think that this kind of um, artistic practices or strategies can be helpful, helpful regarding this education that you talk about or constitution of demos in antagonistic public space? Thank you. Yeah, 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 the next great question. Um, uh, you know, I, I never thought I would say this, but I'm, I'm more on Habermas's side here <laughs> with regard to this this issue. Um, I, again, I don't often agree with Habermas, but um, I think that Muth's understanding of agonism, what it does, what it affects, is ultimately a kind of, if you like, ontologization of conflict. Um, not, you know, she doesn't mean violent conflict or irreconcilable conflict or something like this, but it sort of enshrines basically disagreement, right? As a kind of end in itself, right? Like because the political has this performative dimension, disagreement, contestation, you know, have debate in the public sphere, that's, that's an end in itself, that's an inherent good. And I think this, this idea is, is 
you find this also in Habermas, but um, this idea is pretty widespread in democratic theory that like there's just something inherently good about us hashing out, uh, not hashing out an issue, but disagreeing in public. And I think this really informs and shapes some of this understanding, understanding of agonism. And I don't, I don't think there's anything inherently good about disagreeing. And there's a question I get a lot where people will say, well, you know, ultimately what you're trying to do is depoliticize things, right? You're saying there's just this right answer that everyone would accept and that would depoliticize, you know? And, you know, what I tell people is that, like, yeah, pretty much anything I can think of, I want it to be depoliticized, right? Um, should one be allowed to terminate a pregnancy? Right? Big political debate. I don't think it should be a political debate. I would like to live in a world in which that wasn't a debate. Um, you know, should people be allowed to, um, to have relationships with people of the same sex? That's a big political debate. I don't want it to be a political debate. I want, I want it to be over. That's it. Yes. Nothing. <laughs> no one uh, should be repressed, you know, because of their sexual identity, right? Period. And that's it. I don't want to, I don't want to have an agonistic confrontation with someone who thinks that gay people aren't really people. You know, I, that, I, I don't want to live in that world, right? I wish I didn't live in that world, but I do, right? Um, and so it's hard for me to think of anything where I just think that us disagreeing about it is inherently good. So uh, to circle back to your question about art, um, insofar as art can have this, this is of course a giant question that uh, y'all talked about a lot uh, yesterday, right? But uh, insofar as art can have any kind of emancipatory potential in this sense um, of actually depoliticizing in the right way, the way that I'm talking about, not in a, not in a bad sense, right? Not in another sense of taking something that should be contestable and making it not contestable. Right? Um, but insofar as art has any emancipatory, emancipatory potential in this sense, I think that if it's not identifiable in a sort of discursive, rational way, then I'm not sure what use it could have. In other words, if, you know, Habermasian art versus Mufian art in this sense, um, I'm inclined to think that, again, it would depend on the content, but I'm inclined to think that Habermasian art is going to be more effective. Um, I am, am prepared to be talked out of that. <laughs> I'm prepared to be talked into just art, which opens up this kind of ground of contestation in a non-discursive, non-rational sort of, non-persuasive sort of way, non-didactic sort of way. Um, and, you know, I'm prepared to accept that there might be something like that. I'm inclined to believe the other way, but but I haven't thought about it all that much. I haven't, certainly haven't written about it and um, I would need to think about it more, but that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I can, I can, yeah, I can give you a guess and an intuition, <laughs> but, um, but I'm prepared to be talked out of it. <laughs> Great, well, thanks for your honesty, Larry. I see that there's only, you know, we'll probably a few minutes over, but about eight minutes. If no one's gonna be offended by it, uh, there are three final questions. Maybe we can group them together and Larry, you can tease out the threads as you see fit, especially if there's some overlap. Trong, you're up next. So do you want to unmute yourself and start us? Sure. Thank you. Um, yes, thank, thank you so much, Larry, for, okay. for, 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 for the book. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, sorry, you froze for just one second. Go ahead. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yes, thank you so much for, for this article. And especially being raised in Vietnam in the 80s, um, I think the critique of the form of democracy has come very naturally to me, that it's absurd to think that democracy itself is the ultimate, um, the golden standard for any kind of way to organize society. And um, especially I'm talking about the, um, or specifically I'm talking about the imposing of democracy or exporting of, in the name of civilizing the rest of the world uh, by setting up puppet government, right? Um, and how it being used not just in in the global north, but in the global south, as a weapon against, um, you know, to justify genocide um, of, of many forms. So I would love to hear more about your thoughts on this. And my second question is slightly longer, but I'll make it super short. Um, I, I I agree with you that political education is not the only answer, partly because um, you know back to. Gabrielle's earlier point about the time economy, right? Like for anybody to be engaged in politics in a way that is substantial, um, you need even time, right? Max talked about this, that the, you need time to even engage in it, to, to have a critique, to develop your own ideas, 
um, a, a politics to begin with. Um, so then my question is, in your effort to bring out, to understand what the mass actually doing, like what are they thinking, what is happening to them? I'm wondering, is that again, a circle back to the project of what, is, what are the social conditions that, that lead to um, how they're thinking or how they're feeling to begin with? Because, and especially in the context of the, of the US, um, the treatment of different groups of people of the mass as, as you call them, are vastly different, right? Um, of the Latino population or the black population have vastly different, not only at the treatment, but their own coping mechanism over time, historically. And that keeps changing, right? Um, and as an example, you can think of, you know, how Bernie's is losing so much in the South where all the people, the most people are black and how it affects uh, the conditions that the social economic condition that we are into um, lead to, I wonder, there is a, a, some work, um, emerging work about how the black communities, as a coping mechanism, they want something they can predict. Now, Biden is something, someone they can predict, uh, as opposed to Bernie's agenda, which is something that, you know, is maybe in a way even out of the imaginaries, right? The, the social imaginaries that is of, 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 of black people to begin with. Um, so, yeah, so I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that because I, I think that it is a, the, the, the mass doesn't exist in a vacuum. The mass exists and located within um, historical and very dynamic changes and how different groups within the mass um, have, have different reactions and, and, and coping uh, mechanism over time. Um, yes, I think I'm going to end here. Thank you. Great. Thomas, would you like to share your question as well? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it links up really well with Trong's on the on the idea of the social imaginary, because, um, like everyone has said, I think your argument is super rational, super logical, super clear to me. But when I think about the political education that I participate in, it's mostly arguing with my own family, who I would describe as having like the most normal American politics. Um, that you can have. And I'm trying to imagine a scenario where I say, like, okay, democracy isn't a value in itself. And here's why. I'm trying to imagine a scenario where I don't walk away from that just being called crazy or fascist or something like that. And I'm curious if you have um, any experience talking to people like that about this and how that went, or how you might go about doing that. Great, thanks. And Constanza, you'll have the last question then. Okay, so hello Larry and hi everybody. I will go back to ideology critique for a while. I understand that opponents of ideology critique argue that it presupposes this anti-democratic distinction between theory and, and mass culture as we were debating and that it fails to connect with people's interests toward emancipation, right? And I tend to think that this is a romantic view on the people and on popular interests. And as you mentioned, Larry, um, popular interests are never given. They are produced in what I would call and with a Tuzer ideological state apparatus. So this always happens in, in a mode of production, in our case, in a capitalist mode of production. And for, the, for these reasons, I think that our debate is very important today in a conjuncture where dogmatic and anti-scientific ways of thinking are very well aligned with right-wing projects. This is very, very easy to see in my region, in Latin America and in Argentina, where I am from. But I also think that it is a difficult debate because especially in, in my region as well, we have a very important tradition of populist movements that have left tendencies inside or sometimes even have made really radical decisions economically and politically. And also political movements that try to connect religious practices with emancipatory projects. So there is a tension there. And my question is practic, because it is by, what, by which means or how can we make a, a non-relativist critique of ideology strategic? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, there we go. Got plenty to. Yeah. Um, yeah. These were three uh, 
very good questions, and I think they all ultimately point in the same direction, um, which is another very difficult sort of ending point of this analysis. Um, you know, we're sort of given, we're sort of, you know, two options open up before us, neither of which I like very much. One of them is to uh, <laughs> address people without much strategic sort of choice of words or something like this, to just go to, you know, the black voters in the South that Chong mentioned and say, well, don't you understand your interests are with socialism? Like, come on, get with the program here, right? Or, or to go to your family. Um, uh, was that Jamie or no? Thomas. Thomas, sorry. Um, to go to your family and just say, you know, never mind all this dem democratic and capitalist stuff, like we need to be revolutionary communists, right? <laughs> uh, I can't imagine saying that to my family either. Um, and likewise, right, um, to go to um, even a radical uh, sort of liberation theology-esque, right, political movement and say, yeah, I'm glad you're on the, the radical boat, but you need to get rid of all this religion stuff, it's ideological, right? You know, those aren't going to be very successful. In other words, if we're, if we're sort of directly honest with people in the way that I would, I would regard the, the, these comments as honest, right, then, then they're not gonna listen, right? <laughs> it's not, you're not gonna get very far. Um, and the other option, which I practice on a daily basis in my classes that I teach is to conceal or camouflage or code your language in a way that's appropriate for your audience, right? Um, I don't come out on the first day and tell my students, I'm going to try to convince you to be revolutionary communists, right? Um, I don't do that. I gradually do that over the course of a semester, right? <laughs> gradually try to push them in that direction without ever showing my hand and letting them know that's what I'm doing. But there's something discomforting about that, right? There's something, um, an article I think came out in maybe Viewpoint Magazine, uh, one of those, called um, uh, On Left Straussianism. Right? This is Leo Strauss with this idea that you know, intellectuals know the truth, the masses can't handle it, so the intellectuals need to sort of code their language in a way that's, that's digestible to the masses so they can properly lead them, right? And there's a, there's a touch of that. There's a touch of that in what we're saying. If we're saying we can't tell people the truth, which is, hey, your, 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 your consciousness is ideological, wake the fuck up, you know? Um, even if that is the truth, but we have to sort of sugarcoat it. We have to strategically speak to where people are in order to better convince them of our point of view. I, there's something I don't like. There's something ethically troubling about this, something kind of ma almost Machiavellian, something kind of... I, you know, even elitist about it a little bit. And, you know, like I said, on a, on a daily basis in the classes I teach, I do the second option. I code what I'm saying to try to convince people without letting them know that's what I'm doing. But it feels dishonest. Um, and I, you know, in all these different contexts we've mentioned, uh, I think a similar thing would apply. You could, you know, try to you know, I hate to use this militaristic language, you could try to attack where people are vulnerable, right? Um, again, for strategic reasons, but then you're not really, you know, you're not really respecting them, you're not really treating them like an equal. But then if you try to do that, you're probably not going to get very far for this other reason we mentioned. Uh, and I, I struggle with this, I grapple with this, I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, like I said, I've sort of opted to be more strategically propagandistic, um, but I don't feel good about it. Um, <laughs> so should we conclude on this very happy note? Guys? Yeah, I guess, it, well, the question is, does it work? <laughs> it does, um, it does work, but it makes me feel dirty, you know? <laughs> I don't like doing it, but it does work. Sometimes. The contradictions of capitalism would be an easy way of addressing that dirtiness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Take a shower and keep fighting yeah. the right fight. <laughs> right, right, wrong life cannot be rightly lived. <laughs> exactly, exactly.